Hi everyone, this is Jim. Welcome to round five coverage of my games from the U.S. Amateur West Tournament. So after five rounds, I'm at one and a half out of four, so slightly worse than expected. Actually started off with a, a real strong first day, getting one and a half points on that day, one and a half out of two. And then the second day was just terrible from the point of view of results to, with the two losses. So that leaves me in the hole a little bit and I need to make it up. Um, I have a rule in tournaments that if I lose three games in a row, then I withdraw from the tournament. Um, and it's just been my experience that uh, it's a sign. Three losses in a row is a sign that I'm just not not playing well, and it's better to cut my losses than to uh, continue to uh, dig <laughs> dig my hell dig dig the hole deeper. So, um, but two losses that can happen. If you uh, remember the games, uh, one of them actually played pretty well, and then I got uh, through the middle game, and then I got outplayed by a stronger player in the uh, end game, which can happen in any tournament. And, um, and then the, uh, the second game really was just uh, one horrible blunder. I was doing okay up to that uh, one point. And uh, that's also the kind of thing that can happen to me at any point in time. If you look at any group of my games, uh, any, pick any five games of mine at random, you know, I'm talking slow over the board games, uh, you probably find a horrible blunder like that in them. Um, so two games in a row is not necessarily, two losses in a row is not necessarily a sign that I'm in bad form. It's just uh, unfortunate. Um, so I'm still playing for... Um, uh, to get back into the tournament. A, a win here, and in round five I'm facing a lower rated player. So a win here would get me uh, back to uh, even, and a, a second win would, would put me uh, in the plus score. Three and a half out of uh, six would be a decent performance and uh, would actually gain me rating points. Three out of six would be probably a break even, so if I were to win this one and draw the next one. So I am playing for a win here against the lower rated player, although I do have the black pieces. And uh, he starts off with d4, a very solid choice. I go knight f6, and he goes c4. So now I know we're in, into kind of a classical setup here. Um, against a, a stronger player, I'd probably play um, e6, or if I was in a situation where, uh, well, I sort of regarded this as a must-win situation. So I went for a more dynamic choice. I went with uh, g6, which is uh, my intention is to play the Grinfeld. Uh, very interesting and tactical opening. Gives me some chances. He avoids the main line of the Grinfeld by playing knight f3. I continue bishop g7, which is the main response. And then he went e3. So this is a bit of a sideline. I think uh, knight c3 would have been played there in most cases. Um, but I go for the Grinfeld move anyway. He hasn't done anything to stop it, so I get in d5. And now he goes knight c3. So we kind of just transposed into this position. This is not a uh, mainline Grinfeld, but it's a respectable um, alternative to the Grinfeld. Oh, let me back up. There's a, there's a um, third way of playing the Grinfeld, which is to play with the Fianchetto setup uh, at this point. So knight f3 usually introduces the Fianchetto setup if... Uh, this e3 setup uh, is usually played in a slightly different move order where knight c3 comes out first and then e3 and then maybe knight f3, knight f3 or e3. I forget which the order is there. So anyway, we've gotten into a respectable and a solid line that white has against the Grinfeld, but not the most um, aggressive setup. And, uh, and black can get a... Uh, <clears throat> a decent game here without too much effort, but it, it was, uh, I was really hoping for White to play more aggressively and get into a more tactical Grinfeld position. So this is, this is just very solid for White. Um, I could play c6 here. Uh, it transposes into the Slav defense. This would actually be the Schlechter Slav. And I do play the Slav. I think actually c6 is the top choice in the database. But, uh, well, once again, the, the, the Slav is a pretty solid opening for black, but it doesn't give black a lot of winning chances. So I, I just castle here. He goes bishop to e2. And uh, right here, I wasn't sure. So this is a position I'm not familiar with. Don't see it that much. And uh, I think in the past, I've always gone with that c6, just transposing into a slav at that point. But I'm trying to stay in, uh, in more tactical lines here. So right here, the move is uh, c5. I just wasn't sure if that was playable at this point, but it turns out that c5 is playable, and it's a very typical move in the Grinfeld. You want to coordinate your attack along the uh, dark square diagonal, so you get in this move c5 to undermine the center. You get a knight to c6 to bring more pressure to bear on the center, and uh, 
that's a way to play it. So the line might continue with c5. Um, he can take, and you take here. This is the this is how the line goes in the opening book. I would have been reluctant, even if I had known this line, I would have been reluctant to this to play this way because this actually gives White the opportunity to trade queens um, if if White is just going for a draw. Um, the way it goes in the opening book, White's going for a little more. He goes bishop takes c4, and now the queen comes out to a5 to round up the pawn. Black castles, white castles, and black takes the pawn. And um, this position is about even, and things have kind of opened up. It's an interesting position. So if, um, that that this would have been something uh, I would have been happy uh, getting. So I, I think uh, if I'm faced with this situation in the future, I will. Uh, probably go for that immediate c5, even even allowing for the possibility of the queen trade. Um, but, you know, it's tough when you're trying to play for when you want to avoid those kind of things. Okay, so I'm going to b6 here. I'm still trying to build up to c5, just a little bit of a slower build up. Uh, he castles. I go bishop b7. He goes b3. b3, at this point, we're actually out of the opening book. Um, the uh, This is still a line in the book where um, white normally would take here. And um, we take on d5, and then I take back with the knight, and a typical kind of a Grinfeld position. <clears throat> if he uh, if he pushes his pawn forward, you know I'll take his knight, and uh, he takes back with a pawn, and we get that kind of pawn structure. I will follow up with c5 to undermine the center and, and knight to c6 if possible. Uh, but White's under no obligation to play that way. He can also just uh, continue developing, or uh, White can trade. Anyway. Uh, White played b3 at this point, uh, maybe going for a fianchetto of his bishop. is still a very logical play from White, even though it's not not the book move. It's it's a fine move. I go knight bd7. Goes bishop b2. I go rook to c8. Building up for that uh, push of the c pawn. I was hoping to try and uh, push the c pawn at some point when there would be a tactic. Um, Maybe against, uh, I could trade off and create a weak d pawn and then trade the c pawn. I was hoping to set up something like that, but I never um, achieved that. And I, I went over this with the chess engine. There never was a, a chance to do anything in the center. So I finally go ahead and play that pawn to c5 move anyway. Couldn't think of any other uh, preparatory move. So um, I said, I play that. Let's see, he played c takes d5 took with the knight, he plays knight takes d5, I take with the bishop. So we've got an open line, um, both sides have the bishop pair, and um, he plays an interesting move here, he plays bishop to a3, repositioning the bishop along this diagonal, and um, maybe he's planning to take here, and um, well, it doesn't win a pawn, but maybe he could um, isolate my c pawn, force me to end up with an isolated c pawn there. So I go ahead and take on d4, and he trades rooks and then takes back with the knight. And this position is really very even. I was a little bit worried at first. There's a couple uh, of weaknesses that I had here that I didn't, hadn't really anticipated. This bishop has been unveiled. Uh, it's attack on the uh, e-pawn. And um, this knight, if it moves with tempo, exposes uh, my bishop to a uh, discovered attack from his queen. So I had that pause and think here, find a move. Now, there, there's several uh, defenses here, um, but if you want to, to think about this as kind of an interesting situation for black, what, what move would you choose in this position? Okay, I'm just going to tell you the move I chose. Like I said, there are other possibilities, so if you thought of something else, that's, uh, that's fine. Likely fine. <laughs> I don't know what you chose. But I chose the move queen to b7. So I'm uh, letting him uh, take this pawn, but I'm threatening his um, his g pawn, which is more important. And also notice that uh, when he takes my e pawn, he's threatening my rook. But when I take his g pawn, I'm threatening his rook. So he chooses to um, block this diagonal with uh, bishop to f3. But there was another kind of uh, more interesting way to play this. And we talked about this a little bit after the game. He said he hadn't really considered it. Um, but the move f3 here is pretty interesting. It's, um, it um, sets some little traps for black. Um, well, first of all, it, it solves this problem of the diagonal, so I'm not, um, I'm not winning that uh, g2 pawn anymore. 
the uh, epon is still hanging I need to do something about that and uh, it's a little bit tricky to find a move here um, let's see yeah if I just uh, say bring my knight back to f6 to defend the bishop that's a that's not a good move because this uh, hangs the e-pawn um, the chess engine thinks that the best move here is uh, knight to c5 and then um, he can take and play knight to b5 and he's kind of uh, succeeded in um, and um, creating some weaknesses here. Oh, I didn't mean to move that back up. Um, I meant to highlight that. He's created some weaknesses here. He's given me an isolated pawn, but he's given up the bishop pair. Um, the chess engine still rates this as about even, but this would be a, a more interesting and uh, unbalanced game. Um, the The move I was kind of worried about here is, uh, is um, e4, but it turns out that uh, e4 is not a problem here. Uh, if he plays e4, kicking my bishop back, you know, if the bishop drops back, um, then, um, you know, he can trade it off with the knight, and uh, and then he can later take take this knight and mess up my pawn. So I wouldn't have the bishop pair advantage to compensate for my weak pawns. But there is a uh, tactical answer in this situation. Uh, I don't know if I would have discovered this over the board, but the, the chess engine says black is doing fine here with the move. Um, well... If you want to pause and see if you can find a solution for Black's problems here. Okay, I'm going to give the answer away now. It is bishop takes e4. <laughs> Not a move I would have thought of. Um, so what's the point? If he takes the bishop, which he probably has to, then rook to d8. And um, I'm winning back this uh, pin knight. And uh, so he can cause some damage. But actually... Um, Black stays a pawn up in this line, so that would be good for Black. Anyway, f3 would have led to some interesting play and some some challenges. You know, he could have uh, asked the question to see if I could have found my way out of it. He didn't like the uh, the f3 move on positional grounds, I guess, kind of weakening his king side, potentially opening up that diagonal. So he just went with bishop f3. And, uh, well, with best play, all of these moves are still about even, so it's not like he missed a big opportunity there. It just would have led to a more interesting game. Um, let's see, he played bishop f3, um, and while well, my pawn is still hanging, I defend my pawn. There's no way to avoid the trade of the bishop, and uh, he seems very much intent on trading in this game, so he took my bishop off. <laughs> Queen takes d5, and, um, and he just brought his knight back to f3. And as I, as I said before, this is all uh, very even. So I drop my queen back to b7. I don't want to trade queens. I'm trying to, uh, I still want to keep winning chances. Let's see, he goes queen d2. Cancel that, queen d2. What, knight f6. Just a little bit of regrouping of the pieces. He goes knight b, bishop b2. I went knight e4, hitting his queen and hitting the bishop. But unfortunately, this doesn't... Uh, this is everything's still defended. It just goes queen e2. So I go rook c8, trying to activate my rook, taking a look at the seventh rank. Seventh rank, he trades off the bishop pair, the last pair of bishops, and then plays queen b2 check. And uh, well, I could block with f3. That might be slightly better than what I played, but king g8 is fine as well. He goes rook c1, offering another trade. I go rook to d8. He goes uh, h3, a logical move, um, just creating some lift for his king, a little, little space on the back rank so he can roam freely with his rook and do not have to worry about uh, back rank mates. Um, I go queen d5, he goes queen over to c2, so you know I'm doubling on the d file, he's doubling on the c file. And then I went uh, rook to d7, I decided I didn't want him penetrating to the 7th rank and attacking my pawns here. And, um, you know, he can come in with the check, but it doesn't actually lead to anything. I'm sort of uh, tempting him to play that queen c8 check just to see if uh, maybe his queen would end up a little bit out of play. But the chess engine says, uh, you know, it's fine as well. Continues to be about even. Played queen c4, offering yet another trade. And at this point, um, well, th there actually is an idea here of winning a pawn. And I went for it. I just didn't see anything better. And um, the chess engine verifies that queen takes c4 is the, uh, is the best move here. Let's see. This is move 27. We'd been taking our time. 
on this game, so I didn't want to uh, end up in a situation where uh, where I um, <clears throat> lost on uh, time or got into too much trouble. So, so being that exchanging queens here seemed to give me some slight edge, and uh, getting seeing and getting seeing as we were getting towards the uh, time control, uh, I decided to go ahead and trade queens here. And this is my idea here. I come in with the check, drive his king to h2, and grab the pawn. And, uh, you know, this was the, the best chance I saw in the game to get any kind of advantage. But um, it just turns out he's got um, enough counterplay with his rook. Rook c7 immediately comes here and attacks two pawns, the a pawn and the e pawn. And um, I just push the a pawn forward, and now he can uh, take the e pawn here if he wants to. He made a slight mistake here. This is the first uh, slight mistake from uh, White as well. Um, he plays rook to b7. And, uh, well, it's really maybe a little bit hard to understand why it's a mistake. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, he's attacking two pawns. He could have just grabbed the pawn, and that, that would be completely even. Rook b7 threatening two pawns, and maybe he would prefer to take the uh, this um, b pawn over here and try and get an outside pass pawn. So, um, so in this position, I um, I brought my rook back to d6 to defend the the, um, the b pawn and to maintain this kind of balance where we have the same number of pawns on both sides of the board. Uh, but right here, it's uh, Black's turn to move, and uh, this rook b7 gave me a slight uh, a slight chance here. So why don't you see if you can find this uh, <laughs> this sequence here that that leads to a slight edge for uh, for Black. Okay, I'm going to give the answer away. Now, um, this is a sequence that I had calculated up to a certain point because I was still looking for ways to win. And, um, and it starts with rook h1 check, which you should, of course, think of because it's a forcing move here. He's only got one move. And then knight to uh, e5 check, another forcing move. And then the king comes forward here. And at this point... Uh, I didn't see that I was doing anything great. This is how far I calculated. Um, I, I saw that his rook is still attacking these pawns, my knight is under fire, and I've activated his king. So I thought this sequence was helping um, was helping white. But there's one move here that uh, actually allows black to save those pawns and stay a pawn up. It's black's turn to move. Can you find the move? Okay, I'm going to give the answer away now. The move is knight to c3. It's just an amazing move because the king has come out here to f4. There's this monster fork, and that fork uh, defends the two pawns that are under fire. The same two pawns that are under attack by the rook are defended by that fork. So it's just an amazing kind of coincidence, really. <laughs> that uh, you know, you really had to calculate that sequence out to this point and then spot that knight c3 move. In order to make this work, and um, and it had to be done. Let's see. Let's back up before I played rook d6. It had to be done right in this position. And as I said, I I calculated the first couple moves with the check and the second check, and then his king is activated, and I have three things hanging. <laughs> and to find that one move in that position, that knight c3 move that uh, gets the knight out of trouble and defends two pawns all in one move. It's it's pretty amazing. Well, it shows what uh, chess computers are good for, or uh, really strong players might be able to spot that, but uh, uh, not me. Anyway, so I brought my rook back to d6, and uh, so now he takes the e pawn, and, and uh, so that was my one slight chance this whole game to, to get an edge. Uh, let's see, I played knight d3 here. I was trying to go after these pawns, but he comes in here with uh, knight e5 and uh, attacking my uh, pawn on f7. So at this point, I took off his knight, and I offered a draw. This is just going into a, a completely even end game, and uh, he accepted the draw. So I don't know. This game is an example of how tough it can be to win against a player who's got the the white pieces, and uh, and they they have the white pieces, and they're content with the draw, and they're reasonably strong, so they're not uh, falling for any simple tricks, um, not leaving pieces hanging, and Falling, uh, leaving themselves open to tactics. It can be uh, pretty tough to uh, to.
to get a winning advantage. So I ended up with a draw, but at least I didn't have uh, three losses in a row, and I'm, I'm going into the, the final round where a win will uh, uh, bring me back up to uh, even. So uh, stay tuned for coverage of the final round. I will see you then. Bye.